Gather together in God's house to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. My name is Michael Bing. I'm the pastor here at St. Mark Church. In the name of Jesus Christ, I welcome you all to our fellowship this morning. I've got a couple of announcements I'd like to call your attention to. First of all, and by the way, before I say the first one, these are opportunities to grow in uh, discipleship, what, uh, learn more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So the first of those is grace groups, which will be beginning uh, September the 7th, which is a Thursday. Our first grace group, our inaugural group, will be meeting at the home of Jennifer Brownell. She'll be hosting that. So that'll be at 7 p.m. They'll last exactly one hour. And so this is modeled on uh, the class meetings that uh, John Wesley instituted. Wesley believed he was on to a scriptural truth that dated from New Testament times. I agree with him. So we're not doing anything unique. We're not doing anything new. Neither was Wesley in that sense. I mean, no disrespect to Reverend Wesley. But uh, so I hope you'll... Uh, check this out and see if this interests you. The idea is to bond together as a group, to hold one another accountable, and to build one another up in love. Also, we have a Bible study coming up, which is a traditional Bible study. It's a becoming a Romans 12 Christian, and that will be on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. in the conference room. That'll be beginning September 12th. So both of these are after the Labor Day break, and they'll be beginning. So we hope you'll take those opportunities uh, to grow in grace and uh, strengthen the discipleship and... Uh, relationships with one another. Are there birthdays or anniversaries you'd like to celebrate at this time? Celebrate life and covenant? All right, seeing none, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and only God, we give thanks to you for this day, for this opportunity to gather together in your house to worship you. And Lord, pour forth your spirit upon us gathered here that we might be the true church, and that we might go forth to bear witness to you in a dark world. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Stand and sing how great they are together.
affirmation of faith this morning is a, a modern affirmation. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Please be seated. Today we're going to seek God's blessing upon our teachers, upon our students, uh, because the school year has started. And so at this time we want to show a video to celebrate what teachers do.
trouble melts like lemon drops High above the chimney top, that's where you find me, oh, somewhere over the rainbow, bluebirds fly, and the dream that you dare to, oh, why, oh, why can't I? to ask our teachers to come down front uh, so we got a lot of school teachers here our day school has a dozen they're not all here but you're not moving yet so you're not listening to me <laughs> so we have school teachers we have day school teachers we have Sunday school teachers that are here today and I want to ask you if you teach I want you to come forward this time because we're going to seek God's blessing on you So these are some of our formal teachers that are here, and thank you, thank you. I want to thank you. I want, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I watched that video, and I tried to pick out the kids in there I thought were pretty rambunctious. You could tell some of them had that little glint in their eye, and you thought they're causing somebody a lot of trouble right now. But anyway, anyway, uh, our teachers are a blessing and a resource, a treasure to us, and so we're going to... I want to preach a sermon in a minute when I talk about how we're all teachers, but then there are those that are gifted teachers, and they are a blessing to us. And so we're going to seek God's blessing upon these teachers during the upcoming school year. So let's pray to the Lord. Gracious God, we give you thanks for teachers. We thank you, Lord, for uh, those that are standing here today that teach uh, both here in this church and our day school, at schools in our community. And, and Lord, uh, teaching is a difficult job and, and a, a blessed vocation so, Lord, please bless our teachers, and uh, we pray for safety for their students. We pray for safety for them. We pray, O oh Lord, that uh, they may feel your blessings upon them, that they may be conduits, vessels of your grace, O oh Lord, so that your grace might flow into the heart of a child uh, this year. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all very much. Let's give them another hand, huh? Now we have a presentation, and I need to get you a microphone, don't I? Good morning. Um, usually in the past, on the beginning of school year, we give our rising third graders a Bible. So we want to start with Eliza Barfield. Mason Massey. Yeah, stay up here for a minute, okay. Is Lucy Lee here? And we have Macy Levine, and she cannot be here today. And last year, we missed someone, so Lily Atkinson. She's going to the fourth grade this year. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now, I want to invoke God's blessing upon the gift of the, the scriptures that were given uh, these young persons. So let's pray again. Gracious God, bless the receiving of these uh, Bibles. Lord, may, may they be a treasure 
for they are, do contain your truth. And we pray, O oh, oh God, that you bless these students in the upcoming school year. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's give them a hand, huh? Thank y'all. As we come now to our time of prayer together, I'd like to lift before us uh, a desperate need that we have in our world for protection and for peace. Uh, we are in the news out of Europe with the terrorist attacks and then the disunity, whatever you want to call it, the hostility even within our nation. Ra race divides us. Politics divides us. There's so much division right now. I am convinced and I am eternally hopeful in the capacity of God to change people. That's a quotation from Billy Graham. And so I have this eternal optimism, and so I believe that we are the leaven in the loaf, the yeast that goes throughout the batch, the salt of the earth. And so I challenge all of us uh, to be in prayer for this world, uh, to be willing to step forward and speak courageously, uh, to speak the truth in love about love. And so I encourage us to pray today for uh, God's hand of protection. Let's pray for those who seek to protect us, uh, and let's pray for our, our, our land. Gail McKenna had surgery this week, uh, partial hip replacement, and she is now in rehab at Roper. And so let's pray for Gail that uh, she would continue to heal and recover. And we have Randy and Shy and Lily are with us. Uh, now, Neva is not feeling too good. She's at home, but uh, we testified last week God just plainly saved them in the midst of a terrible traffic accident. We prayed about that in church, and then my son was involved in a traffic accident later that afternoon on I-20, and he is here, although the truck's not here, but anyway, uh, <laughs> puts into stark focus that things can be replaced and people cannot, amen? So we give glory to God uh, for those persons that are here today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your hand of protection. We pray for your hand of protection. Lord, even as we acknowledge your goodness and that every good and perfect gift comes from you, we are mindful that we live in a dark and hurting world. We live in a world that is beset by sin, and we hear of wars and rumors of war. We see images within our own nation of, of hatred based upon race or, or creed. And Lord, we just pray that you would protect us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us the courage to speak the truth in love. We pray, O oh Lord, that we can shine the light of your gospel and show the world that there is a, a better way and a different way to engage one another. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless us as we're gathered here. You've blessed some of us uh, by protecting uh, in the midst of accidents. You've blessed some of us through healing. And we uh, acknowledge this, Lord, and, and we celebrate that, but we seek that for others, Lord. And so help us in all of these things to trust in you and to know that even now you are working to our good and the good of those you love. And we pray now as you taught us through your son Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us offer unto God his tithes and our offerings. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, for all with which you've blessed us. Receive now these, your tithes and offerings, and bless them to do your work in the world. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together our hymn of preparation, Lord, Speak to Me. Please be seated.
Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your words proclaimed, we may hear with transforming joy what you say to us today. Amen. I'll be reading from Romans 10, verses 14 and 15. And how, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. <clears throat> Thank you, Marilyn. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this, your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that we might be teachers and doers of your word. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to I invite you to think for just a moment about a, a favorite teacher uh, that you've had in your life, someone who impacted you greatly. And, and I do want to expand that somewhat beyond just the formal teachers in a uh, setting of a school or perhaps Sunday school, but to broaden that and to think about people who have taught you perhaps valuable life lessons, people uh, that have imparted wisdom to you, people who have been there for you to help you uh, perhaps do things you could not understand or that you needed some insight into. And these are our teachers. These are people who have been our teachers. And so I invite you to be mindful this morning of, of a favorite teacher, someone who impacted you greatly. I know in my own life, I, I had some great school teachers, and I'll, I'll mention in just a moment uh, the influence of one uh, in particular. But then I've had some informal teachers, and one of the great informal teachers in my life was Ron Nelson, the director at the camp where Lucy and I spent so many years of our life where we met and fell in love. And Ron was a, a profound a Christian. I would say next to my father that Ron Nelson had more influence upon me uh, as a man uh, than any other uh, single man uh, in my life. And so I'm very grateful to him. And yet he wasn't ever my teacher in the sense of a classroom setting, just informally. Uh, he taught me so much. And that kind of gets me to this first point I want to make this morning, which I sort of previewed just a little bit when I was down here with our teachers that we blessed this morning. And that is that the capacity to teach is God-given. The capacity to teach is God given. Now, in Romans chapter 10, we have this idea that we cannot hear the word of God unless someone were to preach it to us. And I want to make sure you understand that this, this word there that is used for preaching is really a broadly defined. It's a word that doesn't render easily into English. And it really does mean more than simply doing formally what I'm doing here today. We're you know, up here at the pulpit and, and preaching, or sometimes I've, I'm referred to even my title becomes preacher. Uh, and so it's a, it's a broader word than that. And so this capacity to do that, the capacity to, to proclaim, to profess, to teach, to preach, that capacity is a God-given capacity. It is a gift from God. And, and frankly, it's as natural as breathing. All of us possess inherently, innately, this capacity that God has given us. And, and to give you an example of what I mean by that, all of us at one point in our life have said, have said something like, don't touch that. Right? You, you see what I'm saying? You, that's teaching. Don't touch that. Be careful. That's hot. Right? If nothing else, we've said something along the lines of, I like my eggs sunny side up. So we're teaching others how we like to eat. So we have the capacity to teach. It's a reflection of the image of God within us. God is the first teacher. God is the great teacher. God is teacher. He teaches us about himself as he reveals himself to us. And he has placed within us the capacity to teach others. So as parent or grandparent, as caregivers, as those seeking to raise up others, we are teachers. And this is natural, and it's innate within us. Now, some of you who are perhaps quick thinkers are already thinking, yes, preacher. And some teach only by being a bad example. And there is some truth to that. You know, some people teach by, you know, don't be like that, you know. But I want to make a point to you that, think about this, some very bad people in history and in the world today 
try very hard to be good teachers. I mean, think of some of the worst examples of humanity that can come to your mind right now about criminals or evildoers who really do, at some level, strive to be good teachers. It's rare to find a human being who really doesn't try to at least impart some wisdom to someone, even if it's in a self-centered sort of way. This is a reflection of this capacity to teach that we are given. Because Paul is asking, how can we believe in someone we have not heard of? And how can we hear if someone isn't there to proclaim that? And how can they be there to proclaim it if they haven't been sent? These questions are a bit rhetorical in nature because really Paul is assuming that these things are happening, that God has called people to be preachers, that those preachers have been sent, and that they are amongst us. And I'm here to tell you that you may be that preacher. This, this text here is not talking about me as clergy. It's talking about us as Christians. It's talking about all who would call themselves a follower of Jesus Christ. That all of us have a God-given capacity to teach. And specifically in this setting, I'm talking about teaching the good news. Because all truth is God's truth. So when a, a math teacher is instructing about 2 plus 2 equals 4, at some level that fundamental truth of the universe is a fundamental truth of the universe because God created the universe. Which brings me to my second point. So while all of us possess within us the capacity to teach, gifted teachers are a gift. And I want you to write that down. Gifted teachers are a gift. That's important to note because we should not take that for granted. So all of us have, at some level, a capacity to teach. All of us have, at some level, a capacity to be preachers, if you will, to pro proclaim good news, to bear witness to the good things of God. But then there are those who are teachers, right? My mother was a teacher. Last week I used my father as a sermon illustration. I used my mother this week. My mother uh, taught uh, in elementary school, and she spent the bulk of her career in, in third grade. So we had these rising third graders here this year. That, that was my mother's group right there. And, and to tell you about her heart as a teacher, I want to share this illustration with you. I, I remember, and I was probably in high school when this happened, I remember my mother came home from school one day, uh, and she, she kind of got home. She'd managed to hold herself together until she got inside the house. And I remember my mom basically collapsing uh, into my father, and that was very unusual. And my mother just lost it. I mean, she, she crying, just weeping openly. We knew something big was up. And she begins to try to tell us a story, and it took several attempts. She, she'd start and stop and falter. And she tells us the story that her, her kids were in the restroom. They were taking a restroom break. She was standing outside monitoring that, and she hears a huge commotion in the boys' restroom, and, the, and she begins to hear calls for help. And my mother went into the bathroom to hear the boys shouting that little Johnny has swallowed a quarter. And she looks on the floor of the restroom, and there lays this child turning blue. And my mother said, I knew in that moment that boy had swallowed a nickel. <laughs> now, I was young, and let me give myself a little credit. I interrupted my mother. Because I was too foolish to not do that. And I said, Mom, how'd you know that was a nickel? She just said all the kids were shouting, Johnny swallowed a quarter. How'd you know that was a nickel? And she goes, because he had a quarter in his hand. <laughs> Later, I learned that ice cream was 30 cents. <laughs> if he's holding a quarter, the nickel's down the pipe. My mother performed the Heimlich maneuver on little Johnny, laid out there on the floor, and it turned sideways in his throat. She, you could see the bulge, but he began to breathe, and so they don't move him until the ambulance gets there. Can you imagine that, living through that? My mother loved her students, and it had so shaken her up, and she gave glory to God for the capacity to be able to hold it together in that moment to perform the Heimlich maneuver, and, and she saved that boy's life. I mean, he could not have lived uh, had, had they had to wait till prompt medical help had arrived. They needed, he needed help right then. Right then for a nickel 
mind you, that he had swallowed because children are just that way sometimes. Gifted teachers. My mother was a gifted teacher. My father as well. We saw some teachers up here, you know, people that have this gift from God, a special capacity. So all of us have a capacity to teach, and some of us do it better than others. And then there are those who are gifted at being teachers, gifted at it. They have a very special gift, and they are a gift from God. And I dare say that when you thought earlier of your favorite teacher, I bet you that nickel that I talked about a moment ago, if I were a gambling person, I would wager that nickel that those teachers that you thought of as being amongst your favorite or most influential upon your lives, those people who really touched you in a profound way, that was a person operated within their giftedness as a teacher. And so a gifted teacher is a gift to you or me in our lives. And I dare say, my brothers and sisters, hear me to say this. If you are operating within your gift, you may be that gifted teacher to another person. Now, it may not be the classroom setting. You may not be doing sums on the board. You may not be teaching from a textbook. You may not even be in Sunday school, but you may be teaching within an area with which you are gifted, for which you have a passion or a great desire to impart that wisdom or that knowledge to another person. And this is you acting within your area of giftedness. So Paul is saying to us that a person that is acting within that is a beautiful thing. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's a quotation from Isaiah. And so it is a beautiful thing to see this, and we need to cultivate that, and we need to be willing to live that out in our own lives, which brings me uh, kind of to my last point here, which is that we need to thank God for good teachers, but we need to thank our teachers too. So thank God for good teachers, but thank our teachers too. Now, I've kind of mentioned teachers, and I've mentioned informal teachers and formal teachers. And I want to mention, uh, uh, I had a couple of teachers in seminary that meant a lot to me. Uh, one was the head of the Department of New Testament at the seminary I attended. One was the uh, head of the Department of Old Testament. They were as different as night and day. And it was kind of funny because really while they had a deep and abiding respect for one another professionally, they irritated the fool out of each other. And it was kind of fun to be in their classes and, and hear each of them kind of grouse about the other. It was awesome. And Lloyd Melton was the New Testament professor, and he was a hippie. You know, kind of carefree guy, go along. And then there was Old Testament professor, Dr. Kirkendall, who was, you know, everything is, you know, right in its place, you know. So they just, oil and water, they just, they, they just irritated one another. It was awesome. But so doc, Dr. Kirkendall is a very intimidating character. And I took suicide Hebrew which is eight weeks of stupidity in which you learn the Hebrew language in eight weeks and no one ought to try that. And it is true, I've said this before, that I literally awakened in the middle of the night muttering in Hebrew. Now, I mean, that's, that's the truth during this time. You're just doing nothing. Five days a week, you're studying the Hebrew language. And the other two days, you better be studying the Hebrew language. I mean, it is intense. Like six hours a day, you're in class together and you're doing homework. It's, it's crazy. And I got behind early in the class because I made the mistake of going to annual conference. I should have told the DS I couldn't go that year, but I went. And I really did. I got behind, and then I determined, man, I'm, I'm going to die in this class, so I, I got a drop for him. I'm out. I'm, I'm dropping the class. Forget it. And I go to see Dr. K, as we call him, behind his back. I went to see Dr. Kirkendall, and I had the drop form in my hand. And so I walk in, and see, he saw that form, and he turns around, he looks at me, and he goes, no. <laughs> and I stopped. I said, what? I mean, I was just so shocked. What? He goes, I see the drop form in your hand. You're not dropping the class. I have to sign it. You have to get my approval. I will not sign that form. And all sense of respect and all that, I just, and I went, what do you mean? I mean, I just could not believe. That's how I spoke. What do you mean? And he goes, I mean, I'm not signing that form. Now, you can go over my head to the dean, but he's out of the country. <laughs> and then Dr. Kirkendall did an amazing thing. And this is where he showed his giftedness, you see. He came up to me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Michael, you're taking a very difficult class and you're behind already. You're nervous. In fact, you're scared. And I know that. And he said, Michael, you don't live that far from here. Where, how far away do you live? 
And I said, 13 miles. He said, Michael, my home is right down the street. I will tutor you any day except the Sabbath. You and I together will get through this class. Every day, beginning that next day, I was in Dr. Kirk and I out on his porch. We sat out on the porch together. And we studied Hebrew. I remember one day I was having trouble with the letter Aleph. And every time I, and by the way, Hebrew is as different from English as Chinese is. They go right to left. Everything, you know, ooh, it's, it's a hard language. And, and so we were working through this. And every time I came to a word with an Aleph in it, I was messing up. And I caught the wrong thing. And he would punch me on the right shoulder. Just wham! And I mean, you know, after a few times, I got a little old, you know. And he wouldn't quit. He kept punching me on the shoulder. To this day, I still sometimes flinch when I read a word, even in English, that I know has an olive in it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, thank you, Dr. Kirkendall. Dr. Kirkendall, in the fullness of time, he went home to be with the Lord. He's the only teacher that I ever traveled to their funeral. I traveled a great distance to go be there at Dr. K's funeral just as a way for me to acknowledge the incredible influence the man had on my life. Toughest teacher I ever had. I got a B in both of his survey courses that I took from him. Ah, that's the best B I ever earned, worth any A I ever had. Awesome teacher. So I give thanks uh, to Dr. K and his memory, his family. And, and I want to encourage all of us to take time out to thank those who teach us. So some of us are of a certain age where you may be thinking, well, that's kind of hard to do, but, and maybe it's too late to actually formally thank them, but be, th be sure to thank God for them. And if it's not too late, you ought to take an opportunity to thank somebody. Write them a note. I don't care how many years you've been out of school. That might be a good thing. Some of you probably owe some of them an apology. Mm -hmm. Just thought I might mention that. And then there is a warning within Scripture and, and it turns some people off. And in James chapter 3, James says in verse 1, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. And so there is obviously truth in that. That's God's truth. And so some of us use that as a shield or an excuse not to be teachers in this setting. But I want to encourage you to think of the opposite. If that is true, that being a teacher of God's word it means we're held to a higher account. How much more so for a person that God is calling to teach who refuses to answer that call? And so I say to you, who is it that you need to be a teacher for, an informal teacher perhaps? Maybe not a Sunday school class, may not be teaching that in that formal sense, but someone needs to hear about the goodness of God, God's grace, God's blessings from you. And the question is, will you go? Will you teach? Will you preach that? Will you be willing to stand up and be accountable for conveying God's love to another person? This is incredibly important. You have people in your life who taught you formally, and I know that. And then you have those people in your life who taught you informally. And oftentimes, they are at least as important. And so you can be that for another person, and I call upon all of us to do that. So thank you, teachers. I appreciate you. I do. And I know that you're appreciated by others. And so thank you for your sacrifice, your willingness, your devotion to what you do. And then for the rest of us, let's thank a teacher, and then let's be teachers. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we're gathered here this morning, as we have heard your word, help us to preach and teach. Help us to be accountable to you, O Lord, for this call that you have placed upon us to teach others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Grace Alone. Let's stand and sing to the glory of God.
Receive now this benediction. Now go out in peace and serve your God and your neighbor in all that you do. And may the blessing of Almighty God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you now and evermore until we meet again. Amen.